Hello and welcome to Brushes with Paint, where God meets our pain, our trials, and our struggles with his interventions, the cross, the application of that cross, revelation, his word, and with his loving support. Today I'm going to share several testimonies about his protection in this dark and evil world. I will share some testimonies from the early 1990s, keeping in line with the chronological order of my episodes thus far. But I'm also gonna share some from just recently and also some more from the past, prior to 1990. I'm going to suit up first with his word about putting on the full armor of God. Now, many of you know about the full armor of God. It's a popular and necessary passage in the word of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18. It instructs us what we need to do. I'm using earthly objects to teach about spiritual principles, much like Jesus did with parables. He took earthly earthy examples to understand the spiritual and heavenly principles and meanings. Ephesians 6.12 says that our struggle, our wrestling, is not against flesh and blood. You heard it right. It's not against flesh and blood, not against people, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 through 11 tell us that we are to be alert, be alert, watching out as our adversary, the enemy, the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he could devour. We are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee. The Bible promises that. Darkness will never overtake the light. It may appear to be so, but it will never overtake the light. Jesus is the light and he is overcome. He is triumphant. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse three says, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen us. He will protect us from the evil one. Ephesians 6, 13 and 18 again, that full armor of God. We are to use that protective gear in our lives, much as I have a few in my little treasure chest, just in the, in the realm of our daily lives. First of all, we use an umbrella. It's a type of protective gear to keep us dry in a rainstorm. We have, in my treasure chest, I have bandages. If you've had surgery or if you've had a scrape or an injury, you put this on, you apply it, so as to keep that wound clean so no bacteria develops. It's a preventative measure. We use pot holders and oven gloves when we take something out of the oven or lift a hot skillet to protect our hands from being injured. I had braces on just a few years ago and I wear retainers now to protect my teeth from slipping back to uh, what I don't want it to be after I went through all that pain and struggle. And oftentimes we use different hats, like this is to protect our eyes and face from the sun. And this is in winter, I use it to keep me warm. We also use to protect us, protective gear, a coat. And there are so many things we use in our daily life to protect us from any kind of harm. We use vitamins, we, use, we eat the right food, we exercise uh, as protective means and protective gear. Um, we also take out insurances, varying kinds of insurances on our car, our homes, uh, so many other assets we may have, so that if there's any damage or disaster or a day comes where we face that, we are protected. Let's look at the elements of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, and list the protective gear that God outlines that we are to take on. First of all, the full armor, the one thing we need to remember that the Bible says that we are to stand our ground when the day of evil comes. And then after having done everything to stand, we're to continue standing. That's part of it. It's like being ready to be firm and face what you're going through, knowing that God is there watching over you. The first thing we're to do is to fasten on the belt of truth. That's the first thing listed in Ephesians there. And this is just a belt I put it as a mnemonic, a way to help you remember. And the truth is what sets us free. John 8 verses 31 and 32 says that if we continue in his word, we are truly his disciples and we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free. We need to be taking it in and using that word 
and tightening it up so that whenever we face something, we can withstand in the day when trouble comes. You know, when Jesus was tested in the wilderness and after it says he became hungry, that's when Satan, the devil, our enemy, came to test him. Jesus could not sin. He is without sin, but he came to test them. How did Jesus overcome? How did Jesus deal with it? He spoke the truth. Did he just speak the same truth over and over? No, he spoke the word that pertained to the test that was coming his way. That's why it's important to tighten up, learn the truth of God, so that we can face the day with the, the word that's needed to help us to get through and to overcome, just as Jesus has done. This, uh, the second thing we're going to do is put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I just took a did a quick drawing of the breastplate of righteousness. It doesn't look like that, but it was armor that protected the most important organs, the heart, the lungs, from any kind of destruction or damage. Jesus made us righteous. We are his righteousness because of what he did on the cross when we believed and confessed him and repented as Lord in our lives. And you know what? The Bible says that we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. If we stumble, the Bible does say a righteous man falls seven times but picks himself up again. The Bible promises that we can confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've got to know that truth, have that breastplate on to guard our hearts, our beings from any kind of attack where we know that we can hold on and God's holding on to us because we are going to be victorious. The third thing right here that I have, I have some shoes here. We are to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, we have to be prepared. And before we move, I think of the shoes as something we wear to protect us from uh, the surface of the earth, things that could cut us, hurt us. But I think of it as more of a, a means why, whereby we can move. We can move easily, we can move quickly. Uh, without having to worry about damage to our feet. Well, part of that is preparation. Preparation as you abide in the word and he abides in you and that you are letting that truth just saturate you. You're preparing, you're praying, you're seeking God so that when you move forward, you can give the gospel, you can live the gospel of peace that so many people need in their lives. And number four says to take up the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the fiery darts that are aimed at you. Now, I made this little shield of faith, but a shield also protects you from anything being hurled at you. You can lift it up, you can lift it down, you could go have it over your head. And, and in the ancient times, they would have a phalanx where they would take their shields and they would kneel down and they would just unite them together so it was almost like a roof covering them basically so we want to take up our shield of faith we need to believe what God says he's going to do he'll do but I have a, an extinguisher here that you know we need to use different extinguishers for different types of fires uh, you wouldn't want to use certain things on a certain type of fire because you can make the fire worse and that's why I recommend that you when you're going through any struggle or any pain, you find that particular scripture that meets that struggle and you hold on to that until the Lord takes you through or delivers you out of that particular trial or struggle you're going through. So I think it's interesting and fitting that he doesn't just say he hurls darts at you. Now a dart, and I've just got these little darts, but they're sharp. I have them in plastic so I don't cut myself. But if the enemy is hurling a dart at you, you get that shield of faith. You, you find that promise to stand on. You say, Lord, I know that you're going to protect me through this trial, through this struggle, whatever I'm going through. When the enemy may be throwing darts and they're coming at you from all directions, seen and unseen, but the Lord's watchful eye is there. But it's not enough just a dart that could cause major damage to your life. It's a fiery dart. And I got this little flame torch uh, gun. Imagine fire coming at you as well as uh, the sting of the, the blade uh, just, to, it's just to hurt and kill and destroy. So remember, the other armor piece is to take up your shield of faith so that you may extinguish the fiery darts 
that the enemy hurls at you. And that's huge because once you know the truth and you and you've been prepared, you are you know you're a warrior in the spirit. This is a war. This is but it, the battle does belong to the Lord, but we have our part. And the part is to abide in him as he abides in us and we're going to bear fruit, but we're also going to intercede and pray. The Bible says without ceasing. And so this is important. Now, I may not always be prostrate or on my knees praying to the Lord, but I'm constantly talking to the Lord wherever I go. Sometimes I've been walking and talking to the Lord because it's my habit. People think that woman has a problem. She's talking to herself. I'm actually talking to the Lord. So it's important that we do these things. And the next uh, armor part is the helmet of salvation. And I just got this little helmet and basically we need that covering. We need to know that we are saved. And again, that's taking that by faith, that word that says, if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we confess him as Lord, we shall be saved. We call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. You know, we stand on that promise. And when any doubt would come to your heart, am I saved? Just remember, having done everything to stand, keep standing. And claim that promise that he promised me salvation. And we want to continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. But it's important to have that helmet of salvation. And we are to take up the sword of the spirit. That sword of the spirit it says it's in the Bible is two edged sword. That's a sharp sword. It's alive. It's living. It pierces. But this is the sword of the Lord of the spirit. And it's always good. It's his word. So I put on the cover of my Bible sword of the spirit. We are to wield that about whenever we're going through anything because in the spiritual realm, the Bible says all his promises are yea and amen. Yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It says exceeding great and precious promises have been given unto us that by them we may be made partakers of the divine nature. I take this very seriously. It's one of the one areas I'm very grateful that the Lord taught me early on to take up my sword, to take up that word of God and find the promise or promises that I can hold on to to take me through and get me through when I don't feel like I can get through. But it's like the feel like it's not emotion. It's trusting that you promised me I'm hanging on. Sometimes I feel like I'm just by my fingertips, but he's really holding us. But remember, that's part of the armor that we need to put on. And the last most important one, I think, not most important, but I think it's pretty serious up there. The one that I don't hear mentioned much when people talk about the full armor of God. It says that we are to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all prayers and supplications. So think of praying hands. You can be lying prostrate praying. You'd be on your knees praying. You'd be sitting in a chair praying. You could be lying in a hospital bed praying. But prayer is a powerful weapon. You know, it's, it's powerful. And we know if God put it there, we need to be doing it. And I, there are so many dangers seen and unseen, but God, but God, his protective eye watches over us. And my testimonies are going to be about how he protected me and my children and my grandchildren. And we're going to talk about that rather than focus, though, on the enemy, the devil, who the Bible says he comes to steal or rob, kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I want to focus on that. When a wolf comes to attack and scatter the sheep, Jesus, who's our good shepherd, is our protective watchful eye. He's our shield and our covering. Psalm 121 verses 7 through 8 says, The Lord will keep us from all harm. And he will watch over us, much like the shepherd watches over the sheep. And he will watch our comings and our goings. When we go out, when we come in, he's watching us basically both now and forevermore, his word promises. So with that today, I'm going to share uh, where the Lord did just that. In the early 1990s, my first testimony where he watched over us my children and me. 
And I'm gonna to refer to my notes so that I don't leave anything out. It happened to be uh, Thanksgiving day and we had a wonderful holiday and we went to bed early because we were gonna get up for that uh, next day shopping. It's called Black Friday when supposedly it helps them to get in the black in the good area of their budget. And we went to bed early and it was about one in the morning when I was awakened by the Lord and he put such a deep unction in my spirit to begin to pray, I sense danger. And I had that happen a couple times and uh, I won't go into those episodes um, yet, but he was warning me and I began to pray loudly. I flicked on the lights I felt from the Lord to go turn on all the lights in my house, inside my house. I put on the television, I blasted it. I went and got my children and uh, brought them to the central uh, living and gaming room. We had a big living room and we had games in there for them. And I told them we're gonna do a type of camp out in the living room. And they asked me why. And I said, well, I told them the truth without scaring them or uh, keeping them calm. I wanted to keep them calm. I just said, I was awakened. I felt the Lord tell me to do this. So you guys, let's just you know camp out. But if you fall asleep, I'm here, no problem. And I don't know how they slept with that TV blasting like that, but they did, and I stayed up the entire time. And I was praying. I sensed some danger lurking about. I couldn't see it, but the Lord was telling me to do that. That may sound bizarre, but he did. I felt like I was a watchman on the towers, and um, but I didn't know what I was watching for or against but the Lord is faithful. Well, we woke up and I thought it was strange, nothing happened. And we readied and then to make it go quickly, uh, I let a few of my children shower in my bathroom and I had taken uh, that day and put all my jewelry into uh, a jewelry cleaning jar. And a few of my children used my um, shower and they just tossed their towels on top of it. And we didn't tidy up the house, we just decided to go shopping. So we went shopping for about, uh, I would say four hours. And when we came back, uh, I could see that my front door was opened. It was ajar. And I told my children to stay in the car. And afterwards I thought, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but I said, stay in the car. I shouldn't have approached my house knowing, and I knew I had shut that door and locked it. So I told them to stay in the car. And as I neared and I peeked in and I said, hello, hello. And, and uh, I didn't seem like anyone was there and it turned out no one was, but I had been majorly burglarized. Televisions, microwaves, jewelry from my jewelry case, um, expensive appliances, other valuables were taken. I immediately called the police. Interestingly enough, because my children had thrown the towels on that jewelry cleaner, they didn't even look in the bathroom because it was all in disarray. And most of my expensive, jewelry and gold uh, was not taken because it was hidden. They didn't see it. But, you know, the sentimental things were. And to me, those were the most valuable items. You don't always realize how sentiment is very near and dear to your heart until it's taken away. One such sentimental jewelry piece was a necklace my husband had given to me when I was pregnant with our daughter. And it was special because of his thoughtfulness, but it said baby, it spelled out baby, and it had a downward arrow pointing um, to my abdomen. And that was taken, and I planned on giving that to her when she grew up, just as a memento from what I wore when I was carrying her. And uh, that was hurtful. Uh, but my insurance replaced the value of all the other items. Again, the protective measures that we take so that when disaster or day of evil comes, we are protected. The detectives thoroughly investigated my home, taking fingerprints. They did find some. They told me it was a professional job. They did catch the burglars. And the only thing that uh, I, was, I got back was my copy machine, but it was broken. So it was of no value or use anymore. But they told me that typically their stats tell them that when you are burglarized like this, that thieves will oftentimes come back six to seven months later because they know by then many of your items will be replaced. So they, they warned me to get a dog, a watchdog, or to get an alarm system. 
And so what I found out next totally unnerved me, but also at the same time, I gave glory to God. When they caught these several burglars, one of them told them that they had been waiting. I had, it was a ranch type house and I had a detached garage and there was a stable next to it, but they were hiding in that detached garage, contemplating if they were gonna do a home invasion robbery, but they opted not to when they saw the lights come on. And I don't know, in this part, I'm gonna just guess at that maybe they thought we were gonna leave early or they were hopeful of that, but I'm grateful to the Lord that they didn't decide to do that. I don't know how we would have handled that, but the Lord knew what I couldn't see, he saw and he warned me. But you know, there is a sense of darkness and evil that permeate scenes where crimes have been committed. I had heard this from others, but now I had become acquainted with those emotions. While I did get an alarm system, I decided to move after I had another separate burglary attempt. We lived, like I said, on a ranch house, several acres, and it was in an upscale neighborhood and my ranch home was obscured by foliage. And so it made it a perfect place to rob. And I was driving home with my children in the car when I noticed a car parked along the side. I had an indoor pool area and there it was on the acreage and no car would park there because there was nothing around. And so before I even turned to go toward my house, the street that my house was on, I took the license plate number down. I had my child, I, I said, write this down. They wrote it down. And then when I turned, I looked over my shoulder to see a tall man with white gray hair with some of my items in his hand. And he spotted me, but I was gonna pass the house. I just wanted to see what it looked like, sir, you know, kind of take a look at it after the last time. And I was gonna go to a payphone. I didn't have a phone go to a payphone to call the police because something was off about that scene. And, but when this guy saw me and I saw him, he yelled to his friend and they hightailed it out of there. But that was very alarming to me because I had never seen him before, but he recognized me. And the fact that he recognized me when I just kind of looked over as any person would do when they're driving by, told me he must have been surveilling me. And that's kind of how the enemy does it. He stalks, he lurks about, and you can't see the motive or the intent of the heart. That's why we need to trust the Lord to keep his watchful eyes on us. So they were caught and I found out through the detectives that they lived about, they lived in Bishop about an hour and a half to two hours, I believe, from where my residence was. So, you know, we need the Lord. We need to be putting on the full armor of God. And I was spared from a lot being taken. So I thank the Lord that not, we were not harmed. Um, the valuable items were replaced. The sentimental ones, I never got back, but I have the memories that they can never take away. But as I was writing this, um, you know, writing my notes, uh, and I already had the chapter um, typed, I had something happen just this week and it relates to darkness and I became the victim, but I'm no victim. I'm victorious. And I'll tell you why in just a moment, I became the victim in quotes, keep that in mind of a cybersecurity breach attempting to commit identity theft against me. Well, the Lord let me see it the first day it happened because I monitor uh, my accounts. I am very um, cognizant of, of everything that goes in and out of my accounts. Um, and I caught something that seemed odd. So I hired a firm, you know, a crime identity theft firm to provide uh, and protect my assets and to provide continuous monitoring of all my accounts. I'm thankful to the Lord that he let me stumble on that. It felt like that um, because it just seemed off and odd. But God, 
Uh, I'm thankful they were not able to access any of my financial assets and God protected me and let me see that before they actually got in and were able to do that. As when I contacted these cyber specialists, they told me that as of the day before, they were trying to commit identity theft and we were able to quench that. They also told me about the dark web. And I think it's interesting that it's called the dark web. I really, I'd heard about it, but I just kind of connoted that with other areas of crime, like drugs, for example. But no, they cleared my thinking up in that. They said that this darkness and evil at work in our world has, has um, in the internet is this reason. It isn't indexed by search engines. It's a hotbed of criminal activity. Criminals can buy credit card numbers, drugs, guns, counterfeit money, financial data, stolen credentials, usernames, passwords, hacked accounts, and the list goes on. And you know, interestingly enough, that same, those same emotions that I had when I was burglarized and the second attempt, they didn't get much, but I nonetheless was still burglarized, was a sense of violation. They were in my space. It felt dark. But you know what? Jesus changed my thinking to say, you weren't harmed or hurt. Your children weren't harmed or hurt. I protected you in the two cases I just shared with you, as well as in this cybersecurity area. So I'm very grateful that we have Jesus, our shepherd, watching over us. And, you know, and this next testimony I'm going to give you is very interesting because I, I was visiting Ohio and I'm actually taking, this was in an episode, a chapter I had already written up, but since I'm talking about God's protective ways and his watchful eye, this probably is the most standout time that he protected myself and my granddaughter. It happened when I came to Ohio and I was taking care of my daughter as she had had surgery. And when she was better, I asked her if I could take my one granddaughter to New York as I knew she loved the arts and music. And I had taken my other granddaughter and my grandson to, uh, it's a tradition of mine to have taken them somewhere very special so that memory was created. So my daughter said she thought that'd be a great idea. So we thought I, I wanted to take her to New York City. And it was perfect because my son at the time was going to Columbia University there in Manhattan. So I thought, well, the three of us could have a jolly good time. So we did the perfect trip. We saw Broadway play. We went to the Statue of Liberty. We went to uh, shopping on Times Square and our hotel was right off like about three or four blocks off of Times Square. So we had the perfect location. We visited Ground Zero and it was just wonderful. And we both had picked up little souvenirs here and there, but I did say to her, I'm gonna give you some money to buy some souvenirs and trinkets to, to give to your uh, family and to your friends. But I would suggest to you that you take a look at, around, unless it's like on the Statue of Liberty, we weren't gonna go back to that site or to Ground Zero, we weren't going back to that site. It was a distance away from where we were staying. I said, but look around, see what you want. And on the night before we leave, we'll go pick out and get those souvenirs and, that, and take them back to our hotel. And she agreed and she did do that. And she was writing notes or taking mental notes about what she wanted to get them. So the night before we were gonna leave, we set off from our hotel to go shopping to get her souvenirs and trinkets for her friends. And as we were coming back, I didn't realize we had gone further down Times Square. Um, the route we had taken, we had gone further than I thought. So when we get to this one street, we make a right and we're walking up about two or three blocks and I realized this isn't familiar. We're in a residential area. We must have gone too far. And But I thought, well, we're going in the right direction as far as going up the street. <laughs> and and we, I knew we were going in the right direction, but we were on the wrong street. And as soon as I came to that realization, we were about, I want to say 15 feet from a wall that from that point on, you could see the houses were all connected. It reminds me like of the houses in San Francisco. They're all joined together. They share a common wall. And um, at that time I see this car in my peripheral vision 
uh, on the side. Now we were walking facing traffic, like let's say I'm on this sidewalk, the cars were coming toward us. And on the other side where the cars traveled that way, that's where I see this car and my peripheral vision pull up. And there are like three guys in my peripheral again. And one guy gets out and he, he crosses diagonally in front of us about 15 feet up where these houses are. And he goes behind the wall. And um, immediately the Holy Spirit told me to stop. And he told me, it was like that quick in my spirit. I can't explain it to you. I just knew in my spirit. He told me to stop. And he said, that man is going to try to rob you, but trust me. And I'm thinking, why didn't I turn and run? I didn't turn and run because the Lord told me to stop. Now, keep in mind, we had all these bags with all this stuff in it. And I had my purse that had my transportation tickets for us to get back home, my money, my wallet, everything I had was in there. And here the Lord's telling me to stop. Now we're still about eight to 10 feet from that wall. And I stopped and I told my granddaughter, stop. And I said to her, the Lord's told me to stop. And I let her know that I felt that man was going to try to harm us, but we're going to trust. And, and it wasn't probably a few seconds that and I, by the way, I looked to see if he was coming out and I didn't see him peek around yet or look out yet, but I knew what the Lord told me and it was so strong. I couldn't move forward. But at the moment I just explained to her why we were stopping and, and that I, I felt there was danger ahead. I knew it. I knew it. All of a sudden, just like the Lord, here comes a taxi cab who crossed the lane remember we're on this side where the cars are coming toward us as there were no cars coming crossed over to where there was a parking spot next to us and yelled out ladies do you need a ride and i said absolutely and as soon as we get in the car i say to the taxi cab driver you are an answer to prayer god sent you because there is a man i believe hiding behind that wall and as soon as i said hiding behind the wall he peeks his head around and looks to see where we are but we are in the taxi cab and we could see him now because he's thinking we should have been there by now and um the taxi cab driver said well this is a good thing and i said no it's a god thing that's what i said and i asked him as we drove off and I could see that guy. And as soon as he saw us pass in the taxi cab, he walked back to his car with the, was supposedly the getaway car. God provided a way of escape. And I asked that taxi cab driver, why did you stop? Why did you cross over? I mean, usually we're having to hail down a, um, a taxi cab and it takes time to get a taxi cab. But you went out of your way, crossed over illegally, a lane to get us he said well you look like you had so many packages that you were having trouble carrying them i don't care what it looked like to him god created a way of escape and i'm forever grateful for that i have some scriptures that deal with that it says psalm 31 4 you will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me you are my strength that's one to hold on hold on to psalm 91 3 says for he delivers you from the snare of the trapper. They were setting a trap for us, but God gave a word that delivered my granddaughter and myself. Psalm 25, 15 says, my eyes are continually toward the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. I mean, literally, he just, this taxi cab driver, I'm still amazed by that. And I've testified about that in uh, a particular church service I attended once because it happened uh, just uh, before I went to that church service and I was still just amazed at what the lengths God will go to to save us. Psalm 124 7 says, our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped that's exactly what happened, that in that particular case, God literally gave me an earthly visual example, realistic, real time where he provided a way of escape at the very moment I needed it. One last testimony I'm going to share is where I was at this camp and, and uh, there were many cabins and I was there for a, like a conference and and uh, I was rooming with some people that I knew and there was an exit entry door to this cabin and there was another cabin next door. And 
And I had several encounters where there was this woman there that, have you ever met someone that you knew uh, there was just something very, very wrong there? And I literally was starting to have fear. And I know that perfect uh, love casts out fear, that perfect love toward God. But you know, God knew that I was human and that I was afraid. And Psalm 56, three says, what time I'm afraid I will trust in you. That's a scripture I often hold on to and give to people that are maybe going through surgery and that are afraid. I've shared that with my dad when he was going through surgery. But nonetheless, she was in the adjacent cabin and our entry exit door was right across from their entry exit door. And I was in the bottom bunk and a friend was in the top bunk. And I remember I could not fall asleep. And I was praying and I said, Lord, I can't fall asleep. I, that woman really frightens me. I think she could do me harm. And, and I didn't know why I felt that way. And immediately in the spirit, I had a vision and I saw the angel of the Lord on a white horse. And um, it, he, he was in armor and he was facing that door. And immediately a peace came over me like you can't believe it was that peace that is beyond understanding. And I was comforted. I went right to sleep like a little baby. The next morning I woke up and I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me that sweet sleep. But Lord, and I was relatively a new Christian. This was way back in, like I said, I was going to share a mix, like a hodgepodge of times he's protected me. But I said, Lord, why was there only one angel? Because I had heard scriptures about, um, you know, he gives his angels charge over us, which he does because when Elisha uh, had a situation where the armies were coming against him, the servant that was with Elisha said, oh, what are we going to do? And he said, Lord, open his spiritual eyes, open his eyes that he can see that the armies that are for us outnumber the armies that are against us. And the Lord did just that. He opened his spiritual eyes to see the heavenly hosts that were there, their chariots, their what, their their weapons, if you will, they were more numerous than the ones that they could see with their physical eyes. Well, I said, Lord, that why did I just see one? Because at that time I didn't know the scripture that says in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps about those who fear him or surrounds them. And what's or, and one version says the angel of the Lord encamps or surrounds those who fear him or he protects them. Now, interestingly enough, I was shocked because I said, there it is. There was the answer. And the Lord always, when he gives me a vision, he always teaches me something from his word. And it only took one angel. In that case, the angel of the Lord, that's what the Bible says, encamps around those who fear him. It took one angel and I was out like a baby. And I, while I don't know if she would ever harm me, I do know that I had a fear. And I do know that I was troubled in my spirit. And the Lord gave me that. He loves us so much to give me sweet sleep. And don't ask me why. You know, the Lord gave me that. I just sense danger and it's just um, his peace. He gave me his peace and he reassured me that even when you sleep, I'm still watching over you. And that is a promise too, that even while we sleep, he still ministers to us. He's still watching us. On a closing note, I want to just share this scripture that I love where it says that he is our hiding place. In Psalm 37, 7, it says, he is our hiding place. He protects us from trouble. He surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Think about that. He's our hiding place. I remember one time I was teaching Sunday school and I put a sheet over the table and I told all of them, let's all get in our hiding place. And this is one way I shared scripture into their life. And I said, it doesn't this feel cool. You know, we're in this, and there I am with a bunch of little kids in the, under the table and under a sheet. And I'm like, that's what the Lord is to us. He's our hiding place. We know we're safe. And I said, it's not, I mean, he's much bigger than this little sheet on a table. I made that clear. But I was just trying to give them an earthly example of how he protects and is our hiding place. And he surrounds us with songs of deliverance. You know, I am 
thinking of what is called a mezuzah. A mezuzah in the Hebrew or Jewish culture, and, and I will have, again, what I'm sharing here, because these are very tiny, I, there are larger ones. Um, what I'm sharing here today will all be in that section under the video if you click show more or downward arrow, and I'd love to see some of your comments. I will have pictures of this because it's very tiny. Here's one. It's like a scroll and there's a scroll inside, but it's a, it's a covering. And the mezuzah contains uh, God's name, a lot of times El Shaddai. It's biblically oriented. It's the case and container of scriptures. And it's a reminder of the covenant with God. It serves as a witness to others. They can be purchased or handmade. And they're a constant reminder of God's presence. We have the Holy Spirit. He's the constant reminder that he's with us. He's near us. But what's interesting about this, I find, is that, you know, oftentimes in our homes, my home, I have crosses and I have scripture verses in, uh, on frame, in frames. I have them on plaques just as reminders. Oh, that's one of my favorite scriptures. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at one that you can't see. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And that is hanging there. And I have quite a few of them in here that are uh, scriptures. They're reminders. And inside is what is called the cloth, K-L-A-F. And that's a scroll with scriptures of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And... Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13, 21, inscribed on it. And, you know, they read from right to left. We read from left to right, but they roll the scroll up left to right. And oftentimes on the back of the cloth is uh, the name Shaddai. Now, in, what's interesting to me about this is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, is what's inscribed on the cloth inside the mezuzah, which is the container we are like containers. We are like mezuzah or mezuzat in the case of plural, but we're a mezuzah. We are the vessels that should be containing the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit and, and that word that we're hiding in our lives in these earthen vessels are so that we know the truth. It sets us free that we speak the truth to others, we share that gospel, we know when a fiery dart or a lie comes our way that we can put up our shield of faith and know that it's not true. We can put on the breastplate of righteousness, but the whole point of the mezuzah for uh, the Jewish people is that they will put it on the top third of their doorpost. They'll either do it vertically, horizontally, or they'll do it diagonally. And, and, and they do it for every, at, at every door, except for their bathroom door. And oftentimes you'll see them as they're going, their comings in and their goings out. They'll touch it and maybe kiss their hand, but it's reminding them and they're asking for the Lord's protection because they know that it contains verses in Deuteronomy 6 and verses in, from Deuteronomy 11. And it's a reminder to them of what the Lord's promises are. And we have that those promises in earthen vessels. We have hearts that are should be loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. And basically that's what a mezuzah is. I actually have three of them and, and, and they have like a little scroll. And uh, here are some of the verses from Deuteronomy 6. Not all of them because they're verses 4 through 9. But the Lord says, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. These words, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and daughters. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. As a matter of fact, he's saying, keep them close. You know, we talked about the apple of the eye. But it says, keep them close, bind them as a sign on your hand and on the frontals of your forehead. You shall write them on your doorpost. And this is in Deuteronomy, a doorpost in the Hebrew means mezuzah, mezuzah. And on your gates. And notice not just one place, many places. It shall come about if you listen obediently to his word, which I am commanding you today to love the Lord with all your heart and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that he will give you, and he talks about the blessings. And, and you know, and, and then he also says, 
the same thing basically in Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. It's almost like a repeat of Deuteronomy 6. They're reminders. So when people come to our door, and I'm using this now as an analogy, or come in contact with us, and we're not all, I'm, trust me, I failed, but we should be that reflection of the Lord. We shall be representing as ambassadors the things of God. So, yes, I don't have mezuzahs on my doorposts, and I don't have the scriptures in the case on in the mezuzah called the cloth, but I do have my earthen vessel, and I do have reminders around my house to remember scriptures or just uh, sometimes what I framed a scripture reminds me of a memory where God blessed me using that scripture or answered a prayer. And so I just want to close with saying that God is our hiding place. He surrounds us with songs of deliverance. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Not just some, all. Sometimes the deliverance isn't the way we think it should be. We could be delivered by him taking us home. But he always promises to deliver us. And I love that not only with the deliverance comes a song. Can you imagine he delivers us with songs of deliverances? And that sounds like the Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> but he delivered, he actually surrounds us with songs of deliverance. But God is a good God. And I, I'm so thankful that we have this treasure in earthly vessels. And that treasure is Jesus Christ. And what he is to you and to me. Oh, that, that the world could know that he is the light. He is their answer. And he is the only way. He says, I am the way, truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Remember to suit up. Whether you're putting on a hat you can think, I am, I need that helmet of salvation. And we know there are, there are truths that speak to that salvation. Whether we are, there's that helmet of salvation. If you're putting, tightening up a belt, think about, I better tighten up on the word of God. I need to have the truth all about me, close to me, in my heart. We need to take that truth, that sword of the spirit, that double-edged sword. And we need to wield it about. And, and, you know, when we give out the word, it will never return to God without fulfilling the purpose for which he sent it. It's like seed and ground. And that word, that sword of the spirit is the word of God. We need to shod our feet in the preparation of the gospel of peace. When we move forward, we need to make sure we have been prepared. We are seeking God. We are praying we, so that we can be uh, sharing that gospel that brings peace, the peace of God and the peace with God. So that's important. And we need uh, also to pray at all times. At all times, the Bible says, pray in the spirit in all occasions with all prayer and supplication. We also need that shield of faith, that breastplate of righteousness, all of these items in the armor that protects and provides the buffer. And the Lord is true. He cannot lie. He will protect us in our goings out and our comings in, much like what we talked about in Deuteronomy, um, where the Jewish people and their mezuzah, azots, mezuzah, and one on their doorpost is a reminder to them, he is protecting me as I go out and come in, wherever they're going and wherever they're coming from, he will protect me. And that's what he does. And, and our assurance, and by the way, what's inside here is the word of God. It's from Deuteronomy. And all his word is inspired, all of it. And we need to know that we have that invisible shield that we don't see. And God, who sees everything, he's omniscient, omnipotent, and he's omnipresent. He is spirit. So he knows all, sees all, and is all. So he is our all in all. So trust that the Lord is your shield and your buckler. And with that, I'm going to close in communion and say, we thank you, Lord, that you provided the helmet of salvation for us. You provided that. I'm going to have to use my teeth again. Sorry, because I didn't have um, my scissors here. 
and we're going to take this bread and we're going to remember that Jesus gave his body so that we might have salvation. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. So with that, Lord, we thank you that you gave your body. I'm so grateful to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And he said, as often as we eat and drink, you know, we are to do this in remembrance of him. And, and he took the cup. And we want to take, I'm taking the juice. And I'm remembering that Jesus' precious blood that needed to be shed for the forgiveness of sin, that he did do that, and he was willing to go through such horrendous torture and treatment for us. So I'm going to take that. And thank you, Lord, that you have given me righteousness through your shed blood. You have made us right with God because of what you've done. And I only pray and I ask the Lord for my dear brothers and sisters watching this and everyone out there that as you make the Lord your Savior and as I do, that we walk in a manner worthy of him. And I can honestly say I haven't always done that. And I'm going to share some of those times in the future. Um, but what a forgiving God he is and what a loving, supportive father he is. He's our Abba Father. He, that means he's our daddy, daddy. And that's just so personal that he's my daddy, my heavenly daddy. I love him for that. Oftentimes, when you feel alone or lonely, maybe during these COVID times, and just the, the dark times we're facing today, that you remember there is a light. You know, you hear that expression, he's the light at the end of the tunnel. He is the light before the tunnel, in the tunnel, through the tunnel, and out of the tunnel. He's the light of the world. And the Bible does say they didn't want that light because their deeds were evil. They preferred darkness. But I'm trusting in my prayer today, and my prayer is that this gospel that I'm sharing with you, and the gospel is Jesus Christ, will become the light in your life and lives so that you will know the greatest savior and the only savior of the world that promises life and more abundantly. The abundantly isn't talking about possessions. It's talking about things that are unseen in the spiritual world. Yes, blessings come, but the real blessings are the things, those hidden secrets of God. So with that, dear brothers and sisters, I pray a blessed evening, a blessed week, and may the Lord, and we know he is the protector, watch your goings out and your comings in. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.